thank you so much to uh, all three of you. Uh, fantastic presentations. We're also keeping to time, so giving us ample time for a Q&A and discussion. Uh, so I'll open it up. Maybe we'll take two, three questions at a time, and then uh, and if you could just introduce yourself, and also if you if the question to is to a specific speaker, if you could uh, let's. Uh, my name is Sagar. I write on the, you know, as a journalist, I write. So my question is uh, very simple. When you are talking of uh, the judiciary not taking your view and you are approaching the NGT, uh, why don't you carry most of the, you know, ingredients which have been told by, you know, CSC person that uh, these are the bullet points, they have to be taken over, and uh, there are various other points which the technology has, and uh, those technology has to be fit in by the power sector, like electrostate precipitator, and there are many more also. And the boiler life is very important, because generally it is 25 years, and then uh, you are saying that 35 years for the power plant. This is a very important factor. Although the chemicals boiler fail after 20 years, and uh, this is, and the next part is that the coal has to be washed in the collieries by the washers, which are not being done as uh, the water is very important. And the other part is that it has to be managed accordingly because Delhi, we are talking of Delhi, so Delhi gets power supply from hydro, which is not very uh, polluting, non-renewable energy. And in the peak hours, we have to reduce uh, the, therm uh, the thermal, we have to enhance, and at the peak hours, we have to get all this in place. So the management plus the technology has to be given to the judiciary that these are the bullet points, and then, so how does the uh, judiciary react to that? Thank you. Any other, other questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Jayati Bahuja. My question is to Mr. Datta. Uh, you spoke about uh, expecting compliance by 2022. Now, the thing is that uh, NTPC in one case has already placed the order on one company for FGDs and uh, has floated a tender for the Feroz Gandhi Unchahar Thermal Power Plant also for FGD. The point is that if you don't start now, and the NTPC has done it, and there are n number of other uh, thermal power plants in the private sector, which will also have to comply. How do you expect compliance with 2022 when only NTPC has started? You will not be able to do it. So forget about it. That is one. Two, a very large number of our thermal power plants uh, are, you know, at that stage where either 25 years to 35 years old. Why are you going in, why are you expecting that these, uh, that the government will invest into FGDs uh, in these plants? Might as well shut them down and go for solar, solar, solar power plants. These are my two questions to Mr. Tatt. Uh, so, I am from the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. So, I have a question both to Mr. Bharti and Mr. Tata. Uh, so, CPCB came up with an action plan for uh, 72 gigawatt of power plants, phased out, up to, uh, some phased out up to 2022, some FCT installation, some ESP installation. Prior to that, CEA had come up with a plan for almost similar uh, fleet of plants. Uh, when we posed this question in front of the CA person, he was at odds as to, okay, who's the governing authority here? Who's supposed to monitor this? Who's supposed to even pass such an order wherein you have an implementation plan for 72 gigawatt uh, as to which plant installs FGD first, last, and where, where there's no space for FGD? All this evaluation was done at the regional power committee level. So my question is, what was the talk and how was this decided? How, how were they prioritized? Is there any? Yes. See, my point on the on the technological part and other issues is very simple that, you know, when we went to the court 
and what is before the Supreme Court also is not getting into the the micro details about it because the issue there is very simple. The court is neither going to prescribe a technology nor is going to say, well, instead of, uh, you know, um, coal-fired power plant, you go for solar. This matter is quite simple. The government in its wisdom has come out with a notification. That notification has not been challenged by any power companies in India. All the power companies accepted the deadline. There were interim meetings where the power companies raised certain concerns and they were settled at the inter-ministerial level. None of them said it is not attainable at any point of time. So what is before the court is very simple. This is the standards in terms of water consumption. This is the SOX. This is the NOX. This is what. And get it implemented by that time. So in reality, it can't be even said to be a case of a judicial activism because I told the ministry's council when they were approaching the Supreme Court, you know, for an extension of deadline that it's going to be a self-goal for you, right? Because the court is not monitoring your work. The Supreme Court at least is not. So when you ask for it, you are getting yourself stuck with now a Supreme Court order. So just to answer it, I think what we are concerned there is very limited. The standards are there, the deadline is given there, and the compliance has to take place. Beyond that is not something which the court can actually adjudicate. And, and really speaking, it's for the power companies who are still... And, and you are right so far as NTPC and others are concerned, but there can be no discrimination be, between a, on a private and a government because if it has to be compliance, it has to comply. There is no two ways about it. You want to take on the other part of it? I think, uh, I think you've answered most of the questions. You also probably more comments that uh, uh, I agree NTPC has done something and uh, there have been some move by some both state-owned companies I think, uh, in terms of placing, if not placing order, at least in the process of tenders, etc. So, th but your fundamental point is that if they are in such early stage, will we get to this compliance even at 2022? And I agree with you. So that's that's why we're here right now, struggling that if even now we don't have a plan, 2022 is also fiction. So I agree with you on that. Uh, yeah. May I make one intervention? One, you know, uh, just make a technical one. You know, when we are talking. add one more point to what you were saying. So the CEA has actually said 26,000 yeah, megawatts private power plants also, should be they, shut down. They should be technically so removed. Oh, yeah. uh, in response to your question, the CEA has actually acknowledged that uh, about 26 uh, gigawatts uh, does not need to continue in operation and should be shut down between now and 2022. Uh, and uh, that actually that would not cause any power deficiency in the country. So, uh, I mean, so there is a move to actually acknowledge that not all plants need to uh, put in place these systems. Some would be better off shutting down. So I think you, you had a couple of questions. One was, uh, how did this plan come about in terms of uh, any prioritization? And uh, that's that's a fundamental problem. The This plan is, is not based on anything. Uh, forget about uh, the timelines. We have talked to plants who then they are told that you, you, you said that you complied 2021. And they say that what, you know, you're not planning to put anything in place. So it is the disconnect is that serious. Uh, so which is to me is a very serious problem. I mean, let alone, you know, there's not a yes, no uh, conflict between the plant and the CEA. So I think that's a fundamental problem at the Central Electricity Authority. Having said that, there are plants, as I was just mentioning, including NTPC, etc., who have been doing things. And so there are some moves. It's just that there is not a consistent strategy with over, overarching plan and uh, what should be done. That's the fundamental problem. The second thing about shuttering, actually, uh, it's a little more complicated. Again, you know, they have been in various forums. People have talked about various capacities being shuttered. And uh, given that some of these plants which need, which, which the central government is saying should be shut are predominantly owned by state utilities, they are not controlled by central government. So, so the, this, this is, you know, they say that 16 gigawatt and who's going to shut them down? So, it's, it's a, there's no plan about that either, actually. So, that's what it is. Is there any legal requirement to shut the plants uh, or is there a recommendation from the uh, legal, There's no legal requirement to shut a plant down, but in the sense that 
if you use the same uh, logic that this is not in compliance, yes, maybe that it itself can be used to shut them down. Sorry, there's a gentleman there. Yes. Sir, so if you could introduce yourself. Okay. My name is Sanjeev Aliwale. I'm uh, with the ORF, the Observer Research Foundation. Um, a short point here that uh, this under the Air Act, uh, they've notified these standards. So I presume that, uh, is that right? That's what I heard. Yes, under the Environment Protection Sorry, Act. under the EPA, they've notified these standards. So this is in the nature of subordinate delegation, uh, legislation, right? Now, What's interesting to me is that uh, here is Parliament which has deemed to accept whatever is there in this particular standard. Right? But nobody in the room actually thinks it important enough to go back to Parliament or to go back to any of the subcommittees of Parliament and to say, hey, you guys did this. They were supposed to come into effect two years from now and nothing has happened. Now, this either demonstrates, as I'm sure Navroz will appreciate, the, uh, the entire, uh, you know, the sort of the cynicism, the prevailing cynicism with what parliament cannot, can and cannot do, or it's a hole that can be filled. I don't know which one it is, but I would like a comment possibly from uh, a gentleman who's a lawyer and from CSC who is very familiar with you know, ground level tactics to get things done. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah. Hi, I don't know if this question was already asked. I'd come in late, sorry about it. But uh, in terms of shutting down, I, I, I mean, that's one way of looking at it, but also in terms of the proposed expansion, has there been a talk about the CEPI index and what the role that index is playing as of now? Because um, one of the key reasons for being in that index in 2009 is also to kind of have a sense of assessment of can certain areas actually go further in terms of expanding the industrial capacity and so on. So um, from I had a meeting today with someone in the MOF and they have actually revised the entire CEPI process including the index. And that document is due right now, but um, that's that's actually been in place from 2009 till now. So, is that something that you will be looking at? It's not a law, but it's a policy document. We take a last question, Matthew. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, a question to uh, either or both, uh, Mr. Datta and Mr. Bhatti. Uh, I was wondering if either of you had any thoughts uh, on the institutional design of the standards notification process, right? Uh, if there's, uh, uh, you know, from, from especially from Mr. Bhatti's narration of what happened, uh, it seemed as though this, the standards that was brought into effect was entirely directed by the bureaucratic process, right? So were there buy-in from stakeholders? I mean, you mentioned ministries in conflict, but no reference whatsoever to the broader public at large. So is there something in the standards notification process itself uh, that we need to think about more seriously? Right? Because again, if you look at the Air Act, the Water Act, the Environment Protection Act, all of them have standard notification powers. Uh, it's not clear at all how those standards are to come into effect, uh, you know, who has to be uh, brought into conversation to bring those standards into effect. Uh, does that have something to do with the problem that we're dealing with? On, on this parliament and the law, it's already part of our record in the court. There were about four questions raised in parliament before the notification uh, deadline was there, that is 7 December 2017. And even two months before the deadline, the Ministry of Environment, the minister's statement on record in parliament is that it is all on track and it will be complied with and there's no problem so far as the implementation is concerned. There's a question raised after December which says all power plants will comply by 2022. So, so you, you, if you really look at parliament question, there is no counter question that happens there. So they just give a same answer. They'll be comply and then there is no action for non-compliance. So, so this is one of the evidence we have also taken to court is that even before parliament, they've said everything is on track. So there have been a lot of questions in Parliament. I would say we know about at least four to five questions that were raised. 
that's what I can say. About it. So let me address this very important, interesting question about uh, the standard setting process. And I think there have been some people who worked on this. I mean, it's it's clear as daylight that uh, our uh, regulatory process systems are are deficient. Uh, and frankly speaking, I don't have an answer how to fix it. I mean, if you look at just the capacities of those organizations, in this particular situation, we have CPCB with exactly two people, I think, and now one, who's looking at uh, the entire regulatory standard setting. So they, do, they just don't have the capacity to get data, analyze, nothing at all. Similarly, on the other side, on the Ministry of Power side, we have Central Electricity Authority, which has an organization which has been defined completely. It's, a, it's almost redundant. Mm -hmm. So so you have, that's a current governance situation. Even on the other side, for instance, on the on the generation side, we have serious problems. NTPC, uh, one of the board members in NTPC is the joint secretary from the ministry. So you are sitting on both sides, you know, as a, on, the, on the regulator side, on the executive side. So, you know, you're negotiating with your, yourself. And this is actually what happened in the, one of the meetings where I was. So he was, he was uh, the joint secretaries on both sides simultaneously. So Schrodinger's whatever. So uh, I mean, certainly we have. So in this situation, you have to also try and figure out what's the best way to move forward. Did we have the option of doing, for example, I mean, I would have liked more health assessment studies because that would have uh, validated and supported and built public support for for this. But do we have another few years to do that? So it's, these issues come up, you know, there's Delhi air pollution issues and some other issues. Uh, sim similarly, lots of that problem was lack of institutional uh, capacity. But uh, I mean, I, I just agree with you that, you know, that we should have a more robust system, but we don't have an answer right now for that. But I, I, I just wanted to add that it was also taken up before the standing committee. Uh, on environment, and uh, and they have also raised questions on compliance uh, with this. So, I think the parliamentary processes are being also utilized to ask about compliance. Maybe I can uh, just address the SEPI. I mean, uh, th though we haven't looked at the SEPI part, but uh, see, whatever is in pipe right now was approved and clearances were given long back. I mean, if I really look at a macro perspective. In some sense, that's the least of the problems. First of all, there will be newer, better plants. Secondly, the way the sector is evolving towards more renewable, a lot of them probably will not come into existence at all. So uh, while I understand where you're coming from, but in the scheme of things, the existing capacity, that's where the real problems are. Maybe, I don't know, that big disagrees on this, but that's, that's at least in terms of our focus on um, You know, if you look at even SEPI, even if you go away from SEPI and look at the IIT report, one very clear recommendation was do not allow for any new power plants right within 300 kilometers of Delhi, right? And with the air pollution level being so high, Kurja power plant of Terry Hydro Development Corporation was allowed in Kurja, which is just about 70 kilometers from Delhi last year, by showing the figure of 2.5, average at 62, right? So they showed it, and it's very interesting if you look at the document, the, the summer pollution level is higher than the winter. And nobody questioned them in the Ministry of Environment, and they got an approval. So there's no sanctity to any of the reports that come up. You know, when, when I'm not looking at coal-fired power plant, but if you look at it, we challenged the Amravati project, right, the, the Amravati new capital city, before the National Green Tribunal, and it is one kilometer away from Vijayawada. And Vijayawada is a critically polluted area, right under the SEPI index. It's one. The ministry and the NGT both together said it is true, it is a critically polluted area, but in the list of critically polluted area, it is the least critically polluted area. So when we filed the review, we have said, you know, what is this list? And the judge said, what is wrong? I said, that's like saying, is this person is the healthiest person in the ICU. Now, how does it matter? <laughs> and and that's the kind of uh, 
respect they have for sepi and and just because it comes down from 70 which is the score to 69.9 then it's a free for all so you leave the moratorium you allow everything though at 69.9 it is not critical but it is still still severe so that's the level so it's unfortunate it never taken in the decision making process you had a question in navru i am na patak i am also renovated um so actually i work for a uh, demand side management and uh, recently we have been working for a uh, with, with a client in dalmiapuram uh, dalmia cement and they had a very peculiar request for us that they wanted a uh, software that would help them um, generate reports for uh, pollution control which they send it to cpc so sir kind of mentioned that uh, there request to be some sort of transparency and some sort of data so can't we do something with this kind of um, initiative um to have a concrete data of what sort of pollutants a particular plant is generating point 1 because uh, point number 2 is lot of power plants are going for iso 50001 so it's a um, it's it's for specific in, uh, energy consumption and for that ems is an uh, you know necessary point uh, can we take this ems uh, a monitoring system to generate specific uh, pollution reports as well for further you know helping us to reach a point where we can have a concrete data of what, how we can um, help curb the pollution that would be my question thank you yeah thank you that was a really uh, a great set of presentations i had one question and 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 one comment uh, the question perhaps vinita and priya more uh, sort of uh, can speak to this more but also with if you wishes can you tell us a little bit more about why moef what were the forces behind the moef initially putting forward this process and leading that notification who wanted it because clearly we lot of people didn't want it but who did want it and why were they so powerless so that would be very helpful to understand um second there sort of implicit in all your comments your identification of the diagnosis what the possible sort of infirmities are in the process so priyavra talked about process by and how moef and ca won't really at the table they ignored it and and so on and so forth and implicit in that is this whole model of environmental regulation which is that you may end up with something imperfect but you need to get everybody on board before you pass something so you neutralize your opposition would that have worked in this case is that is that really the primary infirmity second is implicit i think a little bit in what rithvik said is legal infirmities so the the uh, uh, environmental protection act as a very weak instrument through which to do this is the is the process really that the law itself is weak that the law that there is there's a better superstructure of, of legal framework within which you do this you could have uh, better outcomes uh, is it the case that now that the supreme court is watching this it's going to be harder to duck uh, you know which gets us into the common channel of this is all about sort of enabling and working the court system better and it's just that in this case it was late coming to the court system that would be the second thing and the third which is not explicitly talked about but i think has come up in the comments is that at the end of the day what is the political pressure to make this happen which i think is implicit in sanjeev's comment and really you know listening to the story there's a who reports with most polluted cities but there's no political outcry at the public level of a regulation that is of notification that is already intended to be passed that would make a material difference being sidelined by the very executive that put this thing in place there's no public outcry at all about this really to any and and no political backlash why is this not going to eventually become an issue that rises to electoral proportions so which of these three is the is the most productive pathway forward is it all of them is ultimately nothing going to happen until it becomes a political issue yeah i mean uh, we were actually surprised notification came about because we didn't know what made that happen so it's but i would uh, you know a, a cynical view is that it was put in place to actually uh, keep off any negative comments on uh, what was going to happen and it was possibly much more in the climate context than it was really for air pollution and um, and they were and and i mean it's quite clear that uh, none of the ministries were really serious about implementing this so it was more to actually say we've taken action and to be able to uh, you know uh, have a fairly positive story to tell 
uh, knowing very well that it wouldn't be implementing. Uh, that's my cynical view. Um, the um, on on the question of um, political backing for this, it, it's clear that there is a lack of political will behind making this happen. Um, I think that's shifted. So I would say that uh, now there is an intent, but the question is the time frame within which it will happen. Because and I think there is a governance uh, issue of how many different uh, you know, there's the state involved, like you said, if we have to shut down certain plants, ultimately it's a state-owned plant, the state will have to take that decision as well. So I think as in air quality, uh, the, the governance issue is a challenge. And thermal power plants are not really, people are not concerned about thermal power plants. They're concerned much more about road dust or, or about uh, stubble burning has become that's because it comes at that point in time when people are already suffering and it, it comes on top of that. So people are far more keen to see action on stubble burning uh, than they are to see action on thermal power plants because through the summer we don't really feel like uh, we're going through, even though we're inhaling uh, air quality that's uh, way above what's acceptable, it's, it's become somehow acceptable to us. So that's a challenge I think for shifting and communicating the need for action uh, on thermal power plants. So, uh, I agree with Vinutha. I mean, I, I, we, we finished a report, this which we talked about, in sometime in February, March 2015. And uh, so CSE had been doing this kind of sector-wide study. This was sixth or seventh one over the last 20 years, six to three years. So. You know, it's not the first time that we, you know, we had a grand list of our wish list that change this law, change that law, and it's not that we, most of the time, nothing happens. So, in this case, we had suggested NOx, SOx standards, we, you know, new ones be brought in place, there aren't any existing ones, and we made our regular presentations to the people in the both set of ministries, but we were quite surprised when this happened. Uh, lucky, I mean, of course, it was a, you know, we were happy about it. So to a certain extent, I do agree, whether it's a cynical view or whatever, that it was almost to deflect. And the reason I'm saying is that in COP20 uh, in Lima, they made some comments about that we will control you know, emissions from. And this is about GHG, nothing to do with it. So, so they had started talking about it and thought they will do this uh, for pollutants. But really, when, when you know, discussion was GHG, but maybe people were confused, I don't know. But one, clearly it was... GHG driven. On two other things, actually, I think I think this is this is again comes back to the sort of uh, our poor, in some sense, lacking governance that that uh, uh, the broader stakeholder participation I think is necessary. Uh, I think that in environmental laws, etc. Uh, I, I you know Ritwik is here, but I think that going to judiciary is obviously failure of the system actually. Right? So that so I feel that. Uh, having those different, in the democracy, having those different stakeholders, the back and forth, uh, and the buy-in would have helped. But the point is that that was not happening at all. So to that extent, it became a top-down approach where MOEF said, we'll go ahead with this and then let them respond. The third thing, which is kind of the inside thing, is that uh, the, the top uh, sort of secretary at that point of time was a person who was familiar with the power sector. Uh, Mr. Lawasa was a was a power secretary in Haryana, and you know, he, was, he knew the sector. So I think that also made a difference. He had a sort of almost a personal feel towards the impact of the pollution. He had, you know, I, did, I think he lived and he had narrated this incident. He lived in Paridabad where there was a plant, and he said that he used to hang the laundry in the evening because it was jet black. So he had, you know, an appreciation, and also the fact that eventually an ESP was put in place, and so he kind of felt that things can be done and improved. So he was, uh, he was supportive. So I think at that point of time, at the top level of this support, things happen. So back to the way environmental regulation is happening, and in some cases, you know, one could argue that the Delhi air pollution debate is being driven from top. Uh, maybe there should have been more mass movements towards air quality benefits, etc. It's not there. So in the absence of that, this is all I can say is the second best that at least if there's appreciation of these things at the senior level, uh, uh, bureaucracy, etc., maybe at least some things can move. But that's all I can say. Uh, if somehow when there's someone here. 
uh, um, I'm Kumar Sambha from Scroll dot in. Uh, my question is, uh, the, we are discussing like how much consultation took place in the rulemaking process, but I mean there are documents which show that uh, there were uh, objections from the uh, industry and other side, but. Uh, Central Pollution Control Board did take a view that uh, all these things were considered and uh, health cost is much bigger in this case than the cost that the industry has to bear and the time was sufficient. That was the Central Pollution Control Board's uh, comment. So just one uh, on that, like really if the consultation did not take place, then w w how could Central Pollution Control Board take that position? And second, if it was on the driver's seat then and uh, it's a government arm which took that view and even after the drafts were issued. Uh, why is, how could the ministry uh, curtail their voice now and why is the voice of Central Pollution Control Board missing right now from the debate? I am, Mo yeah, I am Mohit from Inter-Cooperation Social Development India. And my question is to Mr. Datta that uh, when uh, the additional secretary became the director and uh, you know passed that uh, manipulation and that five year extension, and uh, you uh, did you pitch that clearly in front of the court and what was the court's reply on this kind of a manipulation? Was any action taken or was it considered? Thank you. Hi, my name is Manish Jaswal and I'm from Engineers India. Uh, I just have one uh, little query, uh, maybe two. Uh, one is that uh, we, as, as we discussed that uh, once this process started uh, two and a half years back, uh, we didn't have any data. So did the government or CPCB started any initiative to actually uh, monitor the uh, pollutant labor in the vicinity of the uh, power plants? Like uh, did we increase the number of CMS continue? Uh, environmental monitoring stations. Did we do that? Uh, did we do anything on that to gather the data? Or uh, and the second thing is that as we uh, one of the panelists said that uh, there were no objections from the power companies. So who actually have the objection? Then why? What is the actual reason behind why why we are not able to attain it? There must be some some hurdles behind it. As far as I can understand, they, the, 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 there are few uh, views that. Uh, they do not have the area available for FGDs and uh, they are not actually relying upon the new technology which is uh, there for the treatment of NOx. I think SCR and SNCR are the two technologies which are there. But some of the companies have viewed that this is not actually tested. So we cannot go ahead with something which is not actually tried and tested. So what is the Pollution Control Board's take on this? Uh, if they have uh, presented any reservation, these companies have presented any reservation, what is the CPCB's take on this? Uh, another thing that uh, we discussed that the price may go up, go up by 90 paisa per unit. So uh, that is around 20-25% of increase. But in China, we did the, I mean, uh, Chinese people did the same thing and the actual cost was around 8%, 4 to 8% in different cases. So, uh, and the timelines was, the timeline which, in which China did it was actually three years okay. for 80 percent of the plants. We'll so, let them take what, what is question. exactly our take on this? Okay. okay, so I'll start with Kumar's question. So, uh, as I was describing that the first draft, when it came out in June, roughly 2015, before that, the consultations were more with the industry experts, manufacturers, etc. I, you know, I'm not fully, obviously, I don't know the full details, but I don't think that there were that many consultations with the power sector generators. But after draft, you know, after draft came out, there was a long list of uh, objections with the industry raised. And as I told you, uh, they started with, you know, the extreme, that it's not needed. And I give you an example, the socks that they said, low cross sulfur, high ash, cannot do, uh, very expensive. So they, they, it was like a Turkish bazaar, you know, it's like, let's start from the extreme. So it was not rational discussions which were happening. So CPCB pushed back saying that these things can be addressed. Now, now that we have the wisdom of the high inside, we need two things. First, CEA themselves are saying that the cost will be around 30, 40 pesa. That's their own memo, right? One. So there is no, uh, and there is so, as far as cost is concerned, as far as it can be done or not, that debate is settled now. So therefore, those interim objections in right now do not matter. Uh, is there was anything else? You, so, so, question, did I address that? 
you know, <laughs> that's basically different. Uh, CPCB is a very weak organization. Even MOEF is relative to MOP is not as powerful. I mean, we know we need electricity. So you know, simple as that. Uh, so so that's what it is. Simple as that. But but on the other hand, listen. End of the day, I am still optimistic because even the fact that 17,000 megawatt of uh, capacity NTPC has put out the bid, another one has 7,000 old capacity. Things are moving, right? And I'll disagree with China. China took long, actually took, took two five-year cycles. The first five-year cycle was slow. The second five-year they really accelerated. So even if it happens in three, four, five years, a sizable number. Personally, I would be happy. I mean, I mean, of course, we would should aim for more more ambitious targets because the situation is far more serious. But uh, anyway, so that's uh, that's my take. I don't know. Did I answer your questions or did I about SEMS? You are asked some questions on SEMS. So SEMS are being installed, and uh, uh, there is issue with kind of devices, kind of data. So unfortunately, the data is not accurate. So we really can't rely, CPC, we really can't rely on that data. So that's the, that's the problem right now. That, that and is, is, there, uh, is this also the reason that uh, most of our power plant is not in the vicinity of the urban areas? Most, like most of them, they are there in Puri San Francisco. So does this also impact, I mean, is this uh, dilute the case? Well, to a certain extent, but it's not, you know, India is so densely populated, end of the day, it's everywhere. So I don't think so that uh, people have forgotten because it's not in my backyard story. I don't think so. Yeah, just yeah. to add to that question, I think the, the mm. public debate has largely been Delhi NCR. Uh, and uh, luckily, there are enough power plants in the vicinity for it to be part of the Delhi NCR debate as well. But, I mean, it's clear that all citizens, all citizens of India have a right to uh, clean air and good health. So I don't think that's a valid... Uh, 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 the other aspect of this data piece is that actually they are supposed to make their uh, stack emissions public and uh, I, I don't think enough has been done to make it known uh, what that what those emissions are in a much more public way. So I think there's some work for civil society as well to do to make it known what's happening. Uh, and I would agree there's, there's, there's uh, some space to do much more there. Two points. One is, so far as the action against uh, the officer is concerned, the court has taken cognizance of it. They've, in fact, the EPCA report also covers that in great detail because obviously EPCA cannot give an find or cannot actually impose any cost, but it can give a recommendation. So it forms part of the EPCA report. Uh, in the last hearing, again brought it up and the ministry has been told to respond. This is precisely what they are trying to avoid is responding to this particular question is difficult for them. And, uh, you know, the next point is it came in about the, the willingness to implement it. And if you see the latest affidavit filed by the ministry, you know, it's interesting. The first three lines says, I such and such on the Ministry of en Environment filed this affidavit. Then it says the Ministry of Power is of this view. <laughs> then the entire thing is not even one line about what the Ministry of Environment, that's what Priyavat is saying, that in reality, it's not something that is subtle anymore. It is in writing. So when I look at that affidavit, where is the view of the MOEF? It doesn't come in. It is, they reproduce, this is what Ministry of Power feels. Now, if you want to regulate the meat industry, you don't get a consent from the butchers in the country, let's face it. So you will have to take the view, but you cannot always rely on their consent. And that is what the, they have done. Again, if you look at it, they're saying, well, so far as implementation of the norms are concerned, well, so far as those projects which are currently under construction, right, it is not possible to change the design at this stage. So therefore, let them finish the construction. Those which have completed saying, well, they have no space. So therefore, since there is no space, you cannot bring in the new technology. So it's either of the case, the only thing that we have got till now is an NGT order after the Supreme Court order itself, which says, do not grant any new environmental clearance to any new project, which does not uh, agree to comply with the emission norms of 2015. That's all. But the fact is that that is new project, which anyway is now down. Right. In last eight months, only one project has got an environment clearance. The point is that in the next five years, we will see large number of projects 
which will be coming up and getting commissioned all based on the older technology without any upgradation and when you go there they say well we don't have space for that so there is a serious issue so our point would be that you know if it is under construction this is the time for them to make the changes and include the latest technology that's all okay so i think we'll uh, wrap up for the day but i'm glad some of you have an optimistic view but i mean looking at the national clean air program of the government i mean i, I don't think power plants is really the problem is not even acknowledged or mentioned so i i don't know where we are heading where the government is uh, i mean uh, apart from the battles it, and the self goals in the in the court i don't know if the power plants are at all in its radar at this point certainly the documents it's putting out doesn't seem so so it's a bit depressing but i hope we can keep up with your optimism priyava but thank you so much all of you for being part of this panel and for coming for this event we are hoping to organize another uh, panel on dust um, which is as is one of the panelists mentioned is becoming quite an important issue and we'll keep you all posted on about that thank you so much thank you